Hi, and welcome to lecture number 66. Today we're talking about historical topic 7.7. .7. That's the 1920s and all the innovations in communication and technology that shaped the decade. So we have one theme, and that's work, exchange, and technology. Obviously, we're focusing mostly on technology. One learning objective, that's explain the causes and effects of the innovations in communication and technology in the United States over time. So let's start with these new technologies. New technologies and manufacturing techniques helped focus the U.S. economy on the production of consumer goods, contributing to improved standards of living and greater personal mobility and better communication systems. So for the manufacturing techniques, we have the growth of scientific management. So Frederick W. Taylor, seen on the top left, is the one who came up with it. And because of that, it's also referred to as Taylorism. So he was very... Uh, obsessed about how workers moved around in a factory and making sure that all of the things that they did were as efficient as possible. So making sure that people have all of the tools in front of them to do or build the part that they're working on. Um, he would get so um, detailed to where he would film workers working, uh, whether it was hammering things or screwing things into a larger part, and he would study their movements to make sure that they were doing the most effective job. A part of this, or related to this, is Henry Ford's use of the assembly line in his Ford Motor Company. You see an example of it in the top right. So workers don't actually have to move anywhere. They have all of their parts and all of their tools that they need, and they are responsible for one task along the assembly line process. They complete their one task, and then that product that is being continuously built gets passed on to the next person so that they can do their task. This is going to dramatically lower the price of consumer goods and the automobile for one because they're going to be building Model T Fords that are going to be affordable for everyone in the country. In terms of consumer goods, the spread of electricity, which had been developed at the end of the 19th century, becomes more widely available and because it can now power household appliances, People are buying new refrigerators, vacuum cleaners, dishwashers, washing machines. And it's mostly affecting the lives and the roles of women in the home since at the time, the tradition was that women would be the homemakers. And so if their job is made a lot easier by having an electric vacuum or having an electric washer, they're going to have more free time or they're going to be able to spend leisurely time doing other things whether it be reading, writing, advocating for um, some other progressive movement, um, it will vary depending on the decade. As far as personal mobility, the automobile is taking over. That's Henry Ford, you see on the left. Uh, the Model T for several years in the first two decades of the 20th century was worth around $500. And obviously that uh, jumps and changes in value depending on inflation. But if you were to compare it to today's dollars, it would be anywhere between $5,000 to $10,000 for a new Model T Ford, depending on the year. Now, Every part of the Model T Ford was the same as every other Model T Ford that was on the, on the road because they were all built on the assembly line and customizing it in any way would slow down the process and make it more expensive. So Henry Ford very famously said that you can have it in any color you'd like as long as it's black. Because the car is taking over and the, as the new mode of transportation and cars run on gasoline, there is a shift to reliance on oil as opposed to coal as our number one type of energy source. Now, coal is still being used to heat homes, but our new reliance on the automobile is going to start us on the path of becoming over-reliant on petroleum. For communication, we have Alexander Graham Bell's telephone and we'll also talk about the radio in the next slide. So we have new forms of mass media such as radio and cinema. They contributed to the spread of national culture as well as greater awareness of regional cultures. Now for radio, the big broadcasting companies, ABC, that's the America's broadcasting company and CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting Services, 
um, end up getting affiliates radio stations nationwide so that way everyone has access to the same news and to the same music actually on the bottom right you see uh, a man standing or sitting next to a cvs microphone that is actually charlie chaplin who is a movie star during this time um, an example of a radio music show that started during this time is called the Grand Ole Opry. It was a live musical uh, performance in Tennessee in which they played country music. That's what they spe specialized in. And so the growth of the radio and the broadcasting of the Grand Ole Opry really led to the spread of country music across the country and its popularity. Charles Lindbergh becomes a national sensation. He's a pilot and he makes a flight across the Atlantic and lands in Paris. And because everyone has a radio, they're all anxiously waiting uh, to hear about his safe landing across the Atlantic. Now, Charles Lindbergh is going to be a controversial f figure when we get into World War II because he will have some anti-Semitic comments and will be leading a group in the United States which is advocating for neutrality because of his um, similarity in views that he has with Nazi Germany. Uh, but in this period, he's seen as a national hero because of his flight. And in terms of cinema, we have the rise of the feature length film. So The Birth of a Nation, we mentioned this in a previous lecture, was directed by D.W. Griffith. Griffith is the most famous movie director of his time. He's the one that starts to make longer movies by using multiple reels. And he adapts this story called The Klansman into Birth of a Nation, in which he's glorifying the KKK. Now, this movie was responsible for the simultaneous growth of the, K growth of the KKK in the 19-teens. And it will continue into the 1920s. But essentially, it's a story that's just making people that are part of the KKK the heroes and uh, African Americans, uh, lesser figures or stereotypes of what they think they should look like. And then finally, we have the growth of the talkie. So the talkie are going to be movie films that people actually are able to talk. It's not just a silent film that's accompanied by piano music. People are going to be speaking and being heard. The Jazz zing Singer is the first movie in which this happens and you can see uh, that the main actor is wearing blackface so um, this was a carryover from minstrel shows during the last historical period in which vaudeville acts you'd have white actors or white singers dressing up in blackface satirizing or uh, portraying different stereotypes of african americans of the time all right, and that was it. So here is our recap. Uh, new technologies, increasing standards of living and communication. Then we have automobiles um, are spreading throughout the United States due to their low price. Oh, and the ability to finance and pay over time. We have radio and cinema exposing Americans uh, to ge generate a new national consciousness and to new national culture. And then also some aspects of regional culture are being spread beyond their distinct regions, for better or for worse. You know, country music is pretty benign, but uh, trying to spread these ideas that the Klan is uh, a, a good figure or a good organization in the country, that's very bad. All right, so thank you for watching this lecture. We have one more on the 1920s and the jazz age. So please come back for lecture number 67. I'll see you then.